And we are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Peter Donahue. Peter Donahue is the author of the novel Madison House, winner of the Langham Prize for American Historical Fiction, and the short story collection The Cornelius Arms. He is co-editor, along with Tom, John Trumbold, of the anthologies Reading Seattle, The City in Prose, and Reading Portland, The City in Prose. He writes the retrospective review column on Northwest literature for Columbia, the magazine of Northwest history, and is an associate professor of English at Birmingham Southern College in Alabama, where he teaches creative writing and journalism. And he is here to talk about his new book, Clara and Merritt, a love story playing out against the Longshoremen and Teamsters rivalry in Seattle in the 1930s and 1940s. So to start out, tell us, what was the motivation in writing your book, Clara and Merritt? Well, every writer should uh, attempt to write the book they would like to read, and that was in part my motivation. Uh, I have a very personal motivation that I'll, I'll, I'll mention first, and that was to tell the story of my parents, my mother and father, who uh, died when I was fairly young, and so I never got to know the, the story of their meeting. And so I wanted to uh, recreate their story. Um, my mother was raised Christian science like Clara, was an artist, was a fashion illustrator. Uh, she didn't come from a family of longshoremen, but rather of cops. Um, my father was, um, was a sailor in the Navy, served in the Pacific, fought in the Pacific, and, uh, then became, uh, went to college, became a labor arbitrator. And so he was very pro-union, uh, as an arbitrator, even though arbitrator is supposed to be neutral. Um, his sympathies were certainly with the union, uh, but he represented that kind of, new side of labor, uh, the uh, more bureaucratic side of labor in many regards in my mind. Uh, so in the other angle uh, was, of course, um, the story of labor in Seattle. I'd always heard of Dave Beck here and there, but uh, going to the University of Washington in Seattle in the 1980s, he didn't have much of a presence um, the way, say, the, the city founders did. And um, I was interested to find out who was this figure, Dave, back then. I'd, I'd hear Seattleites of a certain age mention now and then, uh, including my, uh, w my wife. Um, and then the more I looked into him, I found out uh, the history of Seattle labor, uh, especially with the 1934 Longshoreman strike, the West Coast waterfront strike that struck Seattle, uh, struck the West Coast from Bellingham down to San Pedro, California, and it really reshaped uh, labor history. And I started to see, uncover that rivalry that existed between Dave Beck and Harry Bridges that uh, first came to the fore in the 1934 Longshoreman strike. And that had an inherent drama in it, and that that rivalry uh, was suspended for World War II, but uh, then reunited after the war. Um, the two men were uh, diametrically opposed to one another in their philosophy and their uh, their approach to labor, and so I wanted to tell that story as well. Uh, the Longshoreman strike. Is, is pivotal uh, to the novel. Uh, it serves as the predicate, really, for uh, not only the plot, but also the, the whole historical framework of the novel that uh, pits Longshoremen's Union against uh, the Teamsters in great part. The Longshoremen strike was so important because it, it put to the test many of the New Deal policies that had just been implemented under the National Industrial Recovery Act, including uh, from Section 7A of that act, uh, the right uh, to collective bargaining, which is, of course, uh, fundamental to how unions operate. And um, it was going to see, would these new policies hold? And it was, um, 
It was a dramatic strike. Uh, it was, at that time, the International Longshoremen's Association, which was run out of um, the East Coast and was uh, headed up by a man named Joe Ryan. Uh, they were with the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, and they were a fairly conservative union at the time. And Joe Ryan was also good friends with Dave Beck, who at the time ran the uh, Western Conference of Teamsters, uh, probably the largest conference of all the regional conferences of the Teamsters. Um, and there came a point in the strike when uh, Beck ordered the Teamsters to uh, basically break the strike by, by shipping cargo. And uh, the Teamsters, for once, the rank and file, uh, voted against their leadership and voted to uh, honor the longshoremen strike and not move uh, what they called hot cargo. And that was a pivotal moment in the strike uh, when they knew the strike would hold, and uh, indeed it did. It also, uh, the strike also signaled the rise of Harry Bridges, the Australian-American labor leader uh, who uh, was based in San Francisco and was um, on the strike committee. Uh, he had very different views from the ILA president, Joe Ryan. He was much more of a, a rank-and-file guy, uh, wanted much more to um, really push the issue with the maritime companies for, uh, for reform of such things as speed-ups and, and shape-ups, uh, shape-ups being where uh, a hiring manager would just hand pick uh, who would work that day among what was called the casuals. Um, and speed ups, of course, being what it is, just working faster. Uh, as well as uh, work equalization, trying to uh, give uh, the regulars enough work so that they could actually uh, survive and support their families, and as well as uh, safer working conditions. So Bridges uh, was pushing for a lot more than Joe Ryan did. So he got the rank and file actually to turn down a number of agreements that uh, Joe Ryan had struck with uh, the maritime company owners. So what was the cause of the strike? The cause of the strike was uh, working conditions, of course, as it usually is. Mm -hmm. uh, the things like the shape-ups and the, the speed-ups, uh, the lack of regular work for the regulars, um, work equalization, uh, safe working conditions, uh, giving guidelines for the loads for sling boards and uh, just how uh, ships were going to be uh, discharged and dispatched at the time. And also, well, pivotally, uh, also the, uh, the right to have their union. At the time, it was a company union. Uh, it was, uh, they had what was called the Blue Books. It was basically the, the company union card. And uh, one of the first things uh, they did was uh, to burn their Blue Books to say, no, we're going to be an independent union. Uh, the union had struck uh, in, in the 20s, but had been uh, defeated. And after the National Industrial Recovery Act, it gave them uh, the green light to start organizing again. And the roles went up quite dramatically uh, after that uh, 1933 act was passed. So you basically had two large uh, union representative groups that were covering most of the territory of those people in, in unions here in Seattle? Yes. Well, the, for the longshoremen, uh, for the dockers, uh, the stevedores, it was the International Longshoremen's Association at the time. And then, um, but the, uh, Beck tr had, was very interested in, in that strike. He did not want the strike. He opposed the strike. And uh, he, uh, he sided with Joe Ryan to uh, have more of a moderate agreement with the, uh, 
maritime companies. Uh, then the uh, then the Supreme Court overturned uh, the National Industrial Recovery Act in in thirty five, and then um, in nineteen thirty six, the National Relations Act, or was called the Wagner Act, was passed by Congress, and that reinforced many of the uh, the collective bargaining policies that were allowed under the initial act. And this also um, led Harry Bridges to, uh, to lead a charge for the West Coast longshoremen to secede from the International Longshoremen's Association and begin the uh, International Longshore and Warehousemen's Union. And they sided, they went, they affiliated with the CIO. The Congress of Industrial Organizations, and, as opposed to the AFL, and so that that made that um, that antipathy with Beck even greater between Harry Bridges and Beck, because the CIO, of course, was more progressive, even radical when it came to Bridges, and Beck was much more conservative. Uh, Harry Bridges uh, firmly believed in. Uh, a top-up approach to the union, that the rank and file would vote on just about everything. And in fact, I have a, a, a scene in the novel that's, uh, that's a, a ILWU uh, local meeting, and it's right before the 1948 strike, and, and you get to see how the, how the uh, union works and every, everything that they vote on. Uh, I was fortunate to find the minutes uh, from that local right prior to the strike in the uh, Northwest Special Collections at Suslo. But uh, Bridges', Bridges approach was, uh, he was a, a syndicalist. He really believed that uh, it should be a, a union-centered democracy or an industrial democracy as opposed to the capitalist or corporate-centered democracy that we basically have and that Beck believed in as well. Uh, Beck thought that unions were essentially corporations and that, uh, as he said, uh, the business of, of labor is business. And that was uh, what made him so friendly to Chamber of Commerce people. He was very pro-business, uh, whereas Bridges was not. That's interesting because that, uh, that would mirror a lot of people who criticize unions tend to say it's because of all the money basically goes to the union and then it goes to the people at the top, and which mirrors corporations. Exactly, yeah. It is, it is ironic uh, that unions have that rap, as, uh, but... Um, but it's not always the case. I mean, when Bridges organized, he would, he would not just organize from the bottom up he, uh, the way Bridges would. He would, uh, he would approach managers and company owners and say, look, uh, if you take care of your, your workforce, we can take care of you and everyone will get a fair cut. Uh, and so he was great at, at striking deals. Uh, with management in that regard and ensuring that uh, their workforce would never go out on strike. He was very much formed by the uh, 1919 general strike in Seattle, right, which was uh, the uh, IWW led the Wobblies. It was a successful strike in that uh, it was uh, the first uh, general strike in which everyone went on strike um, and basic, but it basically shut down the city and the gains weren't uh, that enduring from that strike and and Beck came away from that strike uh, seeing it as a disaster for labor, uh, seeing that you had to work with the business owners. But you're, you're absolutely right. It, it does go, it is contrary to how we often think of labor. Uh, but Beck was pivotal in, in making that shift from, I think, uh, the era of the struggle in the 20s and 30s to the era of 
what I call uh, big labor, right? like, like big business or big government, uh, basically uh, very bureaucratic unions, um, in Beck's case, often autocratic as well, uh, top-down kind of leadership. Uh, Beck famously said that uh, you know, I get paid a big salary. Why would I want? Why would anyone want a truck driver to uh, set union policy? Right? That he was the boss, basically. Um, but Bridges always uh, maintained his uh, his close ties to the to the rank and file, and uh, was a very charismatic figure who. Uh, made sure that uh, control of the union stayed with the rank and file. And how long did Harry Bridges remain uh, a leader? What happened to him? He, uh, yeah, he, he remained in charge of the ILWU for, um, I think, about three decades. Yeah, for a long time. And um, he eventually... Uh, they were uh, his opponents were constantly trying to get him thrown out of the country as uh, a communist, and uh, as soon as he rose to national attention, there was that attempt to to get rid of Bridges because he's originally from Australia. Um, they thought they could uh, get him on immigration issues, but uh, he kept winning. His case eventually went to the Supreme Court. And uh, uh, they, they uh, decided in his favor. Uh, this was the Supreme Court that had William O. Douglas from Washington State as an associate justice on it at the time as well. Uh, he even got, he, I mean, he was such an agitator in so many respects that he even, uh, he ca even came afoul of uh, the CIO at times, uh, which uh, in the 50s was headed by Walter Ruther, who was fairly progressive, but he was also uh, some of a staunch anti-communist as well. And uh, whereas Beck, um, Beck continued to rise uh, from the 1930s when he uh, very famously went down to Los Angeles, the city that People said could not be organized, and uh, you know, took his brass knuckled organizing drive down to L.A. and uh, did organize, and uh, it gave him his uh, his organizing cred by organizing uh, L.A. for the Teamsters. You know, organizing was tough back then. The police would basically side with the management, and if management told um, the police force that that there was an organizer or agitator in town, the, the police would drive them out. And so you had to be pretty tough to uh, go into such territory and organize. Um, Beck did, again, with his, his dual approach, uh, going for both the rank and file and um, negotiating with uh, owners and managers. Uh, and then he, uh, he increased the, the roles for the Western Conference significantly and uh, and became one of the strongest vice presidents, probably the strongest vice president among the Teamsters at the time. Then uh, in, in 52, well, actually in uh, 47, during the National Teamsters Convention, uh, which I narrate in Claire and Merritt, he, uh, he made his move for power. Uh, he, uh, Dan Tobin had been president, oh, almost 40 years at the time. Uh, out of Indianapolis, and uh, Beck made his move. He got uh, appointed to this newly created position, executive vice president, which kind of gave him a leg up over the other uh, conference vice presidents in special access to Tobin. And uh, he did his campaigning at that 47 campaign, and then in the, the 1952 convention, he... Uh, he made his move and became president of the Teamsters at the time. Uh, as president, he, he did a lot to centralize the union. At the time, the union was, was a confederacy of these different conferences. Uh, Tobin ran the, 
ran it out of his home office in Indianapolis. But Beck, uh, following Taft Hartley, saw that uh, labor was going to have to work differently. And so he moved the Teamsters to Washington, D.C., the country's power center. Okay, so you had um, the uh, National Industrial Recovery Act in 33, mm-hmm. and then they had the West Coast Longshoreman Strike in 34. Supreme Court nixes or, or um, th- throws out the Recovery Act, and then you had the Wagner Act in 36, right. 37, yes. somewhere in there? Mm-hmm. Okay, and then what, what happened after that? Was there then pushback from that, either from the Supreme Court or from corporations or, or whatever? What happened between that and then what were the conditions that created the Taft-Hartley Act? Yeah, uh, no, there wasn't pushback after the um, uh, National Labor Relations Act or the, the Wagner Act, as it came to be called. Um, at that point, then, uh, the CIA, CIO formed... And uh, labor made dramatic gains after that. Uh, it wasn't challenged in the courts, or I imagine it was, but they did not succeed, those challenges. And uh, the uh, International Longshoremen's uh, Warehousemen's Union uh, grew significantly, as did other unions uh, that were affiliated with the CIO, uh, much more progressive unions as opposed to those affiliated with the AFL. And so uh, the CIO, um, by the start of World War II, was, uh, had the same uh, level of membership as the AFL, uh, a really uh, meteoric uh, rise in their, their membership, or quite powerful. And then with World War II, the unions uh, all agreed uh, on a, on a no-strike no policy during the war, and, and everyone put their efforts towards... Um, towards the war. Uh, there were some unions that still did go on strike during the war, but for the most part, uh, even Bridges condemned them uh, on behalf of the war effort. Following the war then, um, of course, the economy fell into a recession as uh, that industry, that war industry, had to convert back to a, a peacetime industry. Uh, there was the uh, what was called the uh, price wage spiral, um, and uh, unions started becoming active again, especially the the Longshoremen's Union on the West Coast. They did have a, uh, there was a 1946 strike. Uh, that was basically an economic strike looking for a 15 cent an hour wage increase. And then uh, in 46, the uh, Republican Congress, Republicans took over Congress, and that's when uh, the uh, Labor Management Act, or uh, Taft-Hartley, was passed. It was vetoed by Truman, but it, um, his veto was overridden by the Congress. And so it went into effect. It basically aimed to rescind uh, many of the gains that was made that were made by labor in the 30s during the New Deal, it uh, put severe restrictions on the kind of strikes uh, unions could have, uh, how they could strike. It implemented what we all know now as uh, the right to work. It allowed states to to state legislators to uh, enact right to work policies in which uh, no closed shop shop unions, no closed shop workplaces um, could uh, could exist in the state. Um, it also made, it also required everyone to sign an anti-communist uh, affidavit as well, which uh, Beck refused to sign. I mean, excuse me, Bridges refused to sign, but uh, Beck readily signed it. But um, even Beck saw that Taft-Hartley was a serious threat to unions. And uh, he, he, uh, he came out very strongly against it, uh, as did pretty much everybody in labor. But he also saw that with Taft-Hartley, the future of unions was going to be shifting from oh, on the street to the courtroom and uh, the halls of legislatures. Uh, so lawyers and, 
and lobbyists were going to be the key to the future of labor. And that's what, in great part, Claire and Merritt tries to capture. You know, there are a lot of novels, the, especially from the 30s, the proletarian novels, that, that look at the struggle and focus on uh, strikes, often strikes that fail. Uh, but I wanted to look at that shift from the struggle to big labor and uh, where it went from the picket lines to the, the bigger bureaucracy. And I don't mean that pejoratively about unions. It's, it was, in fact, it was very smart of Beck, I think. He recognized this. And, uh, and that's where merit comes into play because merit is um, a college student of course, um, uh, union members, working union members, uh, often had a great antipathy towards uh, college students, uh, especially uh, longshoremen, because in Seattle, uh, college students, uh, football players in many instances, were used as uh, scabs, or strike breakers, rather, uh, to uh, haul cargo, to dispatch uh, ships, discharge ships, and uh, you know would would be uh, would be sent out on uh, boats where they would uh, have basically dormitories out in the harbor and then be brought in on tugboats uh, to the piers to uh, discharge ships. Uh, so that's in great part where uh, where some of the antipathy from Clara's family comes towards Merritt in the novel is that he's he is a college student. Uh, but but Beck saw that the uh, he was going to need a, a, a smart and college educated staff to to really work around Taft Hartley because the penalties were severe. Uh, you could get jailed. You can get the union could be severely fined uh, for violating some of the new regulations. When did and what was the primary motivation in the joining of the AFL CIO? When did that occur? That occurred. Um, well, my book only goes up to 48. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe that occurred in the 50s. Uh, it, it was, I, I, I believe, in great response to Taft-Hartley, a way to um, unify labor under the, uh, uh, to defend against the siege uh, that they were under with Taft-Hartley. Uh, it was not a, a, always a happy marriage. I mean, George, George Meany of the AFL and Walter Ruther of the uh, CIO did not always uh, see eye to eye. Well, with that, we are unfortunately out of time. I want to thank you for coming in and spending time with us this morning. Thank you again.